Hi everyone, ever since 2008, I, like every other boy that watched the Iron Man film, have really wanted my own workshop studio. Dare I say that film is probably the reason I'm doing computer related stuff nowadays anyway, but provided that everything goes okay, I might finally have access to a 40 something square meter space where I can finally design and make my own studio, and I thought this would be a perfect project to do in Blender. It would be a long term project, we'd start off with some basic block house and move on to concepting, and then over time as I get more information about dimensions and electronics and stuff like that, then we could refine it into a more realistic plan. And as things are renovated and made IRL, then I could show that in a future process video. So I think this is the first step. This is me showing the block out and how I've started doing the concepting. And I'll explain the layout of the studio and the psychology behind certain things and why I've gone for certain styles and give you some tips in Blender along the way. So are you ready for the video? I designed my future studio in Blender. All right, well, let's begin. So one thing I knew from the beginning was that I wanted different spaces for the different kinds of work I wanted to do. Space for the sake of space is pointless, so I wanted to make sure that these would actually be spaces that I would use. The five spaces I've settled on are digital, computer slash networking, physical, negative space, and admin. And I'll explain in my mind what these mean. The digital space is essentially what I have here right now. It's where I do my digital work at the computer. There's nothing new about this. The computer and network workspace is where my computer will actually live. This is where I'll be able to do any upgrades and store some of my old computer computers as well, which I don't really have access to here. So if I wanted to make any upgrades or build new computers from the old parts, then this is where that will happen. It'll be a very static, conscious environment. The physical workspace is for the physical environment, so this is where the 3D printer will live, and I have access to a small robotic arm, which I will also put here, I think, because maybe I could get that to help me automate certain projects. There's a list of 3D printing projects I want to try, and I've wanted to do them for such a long time, but I don't have a 3D printer because I don't have the space for it yet, so this is where those projects will live. The negative space here is for mocap recordings, for recordings in front of the green screen, for virtual reality, and all sorts of other things that just require space. I think there are a lot of people watching that will know that as soon as you start taking up space in a room, it's gone forever. Like it's very difficult to get free space back after you've used it up. So for right from the beginning, I'm going to make sure that I have a negative space that nothing will exist in. So that's what this represents here on the floor. And then I have the admin space. This is a bit different. It's more of a strategic thinking zone. It's where I can look around at the other workspaces in the room and kind of treat them as memory markers and make decisions while I'm messaging people. I thought it'd be nice to write messages to people in a separate location to the other workspaces because Lord knows how easily I get distracted while writing emails. Reddit is the bane of my existence. I have to make sure I close that tab whenever I'm writing emails. I've also noticed that when I'm doing things that are mentally quite intense, like programming, for example, after I finish a menial task, I'll tend to stand up and walk away from the computer for a little while just to give my mind space to breathe almost. So I think having an admin space is quite nice because instead of leaving the studio and going for a walk like a decent healthy human being, maybe I'll just have a small space inside the studio where I can quickly walk to, pretend I'm decompressing, and then go back to the computer afterwards. Although right now where I've got it is right next to the digital workspace, I may actually swap it with the physical one and kind of have it further away so I have further to walk, but I'm, I'm still planning it out. I might also be curious and wondering what all these kind of yellow blocks are around the room. Well, thanks to Blender's collection system, which came in with version 2.8 of Blender, we can kind of enable and disable different categories of objects, and I thought, well, wouldn't it be nice just to visualize the storage capacity of the room? So you can see up here I have a collection called Storage, and if I turn that off and on, you can see that these yellow blocks are appearing and disappearing. Now, of course, there would be more storage space in this room, even under the tables where I could have like cabinets and stuff. But I just thought for like visualizing the interior capacity of certain things, this would be really cool. I would also quite like to make another collection where I can visualize the cable layouts, where I can put little things to organize the cable so they're not hanging all over the place. And maybe I would color those in some kind of like cyan or another bright, vibrant color just to make them easily identifiable. But let's talk about how I actually block this out in Blender. Well, I'm going to disable this nice concept and enable a not so nice concept. This is the kind of much more ugly original concept that was going on. I took the basic dimensions of the room from the general floor plan, and I thought from a top-down perspective, first of all, I was like, okay, well, in this corner, I want to have digital, computer there, physical there, and admin there. I just blocked it out from basic cubes, basic primitives, because when you're working on a concept and you don't have accurate dimensions, you don't really need much else than that. And it really is quite simple to put together. I mean, this is the same kind of principle you have with level design in video games. You don't work from maximum detail right from the beginning, I mean, unless you have everything else already planned out. But generally, you work from block out, so you have a basic basic silhouette of what you want the environment to look like, you can rapidly prototype and move things around, consider like the flow of gameplay and such. And then once that's approved and people are happy with it, then you can add more details over time by doing detail passes essentially. And with this, the same principle applies because we're just concepting and blocking out everything is made with basic cubes, even the chairs and some random things scattered around the tables. And then you can see here, if I disable this basic block out and then enable the more detailed concept, things are a lot more better proportioned. The good thing about using basic cubes and primitives and stuff inside of 
to your original block out is that they're so easy to move around. We can also very easily make changes to the sizes because if I go into edit mode here and then select some vertices, I can just drag these out and change the proportions of the object without worrying about extra details on the model. So if I want to have the table coming all the way out into the room, then that's very easy to do. Another cool thing about Blender is again, another change that was added with 2.8, I think, is that you can edit multiple objects at once. So if you wanted to change the proportions of things like this again, like multiple tables at once, then we can do that just by selecting both of the objects, going into edit mode, choosing the vertices and then dragging them around. So Blender is actually quite fantastic for doing this rapid prototyping level design. Now you'll notice here that I have both the block out and the more detailed concept in one file. This is not actually how I had it laid out to start with. I was making different versions of the files so that if one got corrupted or broken, then I would still have backups. And that's what you would call incremental saving, where every chronological step you take on your design process, you can go back to it like version control. But for the sake of showing this easier in the actual video, I've combined them into one blend file so I can easily disable and enable where appropriate. So another fantastic thing about Blender is it can help me visualize the sight lines. And what I mean by that is I have one of my rigged based characters here, which you can pick up from my gun mode, and I've attached a camera to the head bone. Now the way you can do this is if you have an object selected like the camera and then you shift select the armature and then you go into the pose mode and then you click on the bone you want to parent the camera to and then press control P and then choose bone relative, it will attach that object to the bone. So whenever you move that bone, the camera is going to follow with it. So what that means now is if I move my character around and if I move the head around, you can see that the camera is actually changing its direction. Now if I press zero on the numpad, I can actually enter the view for that camera. And then if we enter the walk navigation mode, which I actually have bound to shift F, we can now look around with the mouse. So while I'm visualizing that I'm sitting at the computer in this blend file, I can actually pretend that I'm in the scene and looking around. And I've tried to scale this character model so it's roughly my height, which is about 5'8". So I can think, ah, yes, while I'm sitting at my triple monitor setup, I can look to the right and see the admin zone, things on the wall, I can see where the entrance to the room is as well, and everything else. So this just goes to show that Blender is not just great for the modeling and rendering aspect of things, but also for the visualization aspect, because you can rig up your sight lines. And you know, maybe some other concepts for this as well. If you had cameras in the room, like, you know, security cameras, then you'd be able to visualize what those can see as well. So you know you can get the exact positions right. One thing I do want to note as well is that Blender is not CAD software, CAD meaning computer aided design. So it's not strictly designed for doing accurate measurements and product designs and stuff like that. But Blender is perfectly fine for doing concepting like this, stuff that can be passed on to the other people that would make more accurate designs. And another note I want to make as well is about dimensions, because say we have a primitive cube here that I've made. If I open the end menu and then go to item at the top, we're all very used to seeing the location, the rotation and the scale values, but we don't often hear about the dimension values. So notice that as I'm changing the scaling for the object in the object mode, we can see the scale change, which is as we expect. But if I go into edit mode and then change the face and move that out, the scaling changes the same, but the dimensions are not uniform anymore. And that's because what the dimensions is actually telling us is essentially the bounding box size. So if you created a box around the mesh that you have, no matter what size it is, the dimensions of that box in terms of the unit scale that you're using, in this case meters, is going to be represented here in the dimensions value. And we can modify this as well, but I would not recommend doing that because that's going to really mess with your scale at the same time. As you can see here, as I modify the Y value, the Y scale is also changing. All right, so let's talk about some of the reasons for this layout, because I'm sure there are lots of people that are going to have some comments about, oh, why are you wasting space in this way? Well, let's take a look. I want the digital workspace to be at the back corner of the room for a few reasons. Number one is my anxiety. I want to make sure that I can see the entrance to the room, which will be back here, so I don't have anyone sneaking up on me. The second reason is that I've noticed that how I'm having my computer at the moment, which is where it's against a wall, I have light reflecting off the wall because it's partially specular, and this kind of messes with my sense of balance. I have some vestibular issues, so when the computer monitors are wobbling, my brain can't really interpret where the horizon level is, especially with this wall going on. And what I've noticed is that when I'm in rooms where there's things behind the monitors, so in this case it'll be like the other workspaces in the rest of the room, it really helps with those issues, it prevents them from happening. So I actually have some position references in the room in front of me. Maybe you can think of it as like tracking, but for my brain. And I've tried to convince people I'm not a robot, but this probably won't help the case. Also, I think it's quite nice being able to see the rest of the room from this digital space because I'm going to be doing a lot of thinking and planning here, but not as much as the admin space, which we'll get onto in a minute. So both the computer slash network space and the physical workspaces are facing the wall. And the reason for this is because I'm going to be facing down, mostly focusing on what I'm working on. I don't need to see anything else in the room and I don't really want to be distracted by what else is going on. And for the computer network space, especially, I'm probably going to need a bit of help 
help and guidance while working on the computer. So maybe I could have like a Linus Tech Tips video going on the TV screen while I'm working. But speaking about this screen, why is it so big and why is it there? You know, it's, it almost feels too big. And yeah, that's kind of like a work in progress size. But what I was thinking was that if I'm standing in front of my expandable green screen here and I have a tripod and I'm doing a recording while standing up and I'm looking down the room like this, that TV can double up as a prompt or an auto cue. Or, you know, if I'm just spitballing things and maybe I can put something that's motivational on the screen. And by motivational, what I mean is maybe I can just record my parents shaking their heads in a very disapproving way and I can just play that on a loop because I'm sure that will help me keep working. <laughs> Or maybe if I'm feeling particularly anxious, I can just put some, you know, like cute animals or something on the screen and that'll just help me get through the project. Now, the way we're thinking about having the back of the room here, and you might ask why there's some extra space wasted back there, is because we're probably going to keep the garage door. It kind of rolls up and have a patio door behind it where natural light could be let in. So I don't want to have anything that obstructs the pathway for the garage door. So the expandable green screen, which you probably have seen in other videos already, can be raised and lowered as appropriate and I can move that elsewhere. So it's not too obstructive where it stands. I also think that if I didn't want to use the green screen for a video, background while I'm talking. If I'm just standing in the middle here, I can just rotate the tripod around and have anywhere else in the studio act as a nice background. So that's why I think having the central space for recording rather than like a wall, for example, is probably the ideal location. The green screen and the nice backgrounds, so we have freedom of choice. So again, theoretically, I can use the walk mode here to visualize what it looks like from the admin perspective. So what I like about this is here is where I'll do the kind of high level strategic thinking about things. What projects I want to work on, everything around the room will act as a visual memory marker. Because I have noticed again, kind of psychology wise, my memory is very visually based. I'll be able to see, okay, well, that's what I'm working on in the digital space, computer and physical space. And I've left this here in the negative space. So I can kind of plan out what needs to be done next. And I feel like this is the ideal kind of location to be writing messages to people because I can keep all of those things in mind have a better idea for kind of time management and planning. And again, it kind of removes distractions, which, you know, Reddit. So one thing I'm not completely convinced on is I might swap the admin and the physical spaces around to have the admin on the other side of the room. Now, the original reason why the admin is next to the digital workspace is because originally I was thinking while I'm making notes on my computer, I can pass those notes on to my future self and the admin space. So when I need to write messages and make plans and notes for what I need to do, I will have those notes available. But then I kind of thought to myself, well, that's not really necessary. If I have a cabinet next to me on the left here, I can just put those notes there and then take them with me wherever I go. And also if I can visually see the admin space on the other side of the room and have it very warm and attractive in an exciting way, then it might encourage me to actually want to take breaks from the computer. So I might swap those around. This is a work in progress. Okay, so obviously having a look back at the basic block out and then moving on to the more detailed block out, some things are very different here visually. So what changed? Did I make all these assets myself? No, of course I didn't. For things like these tables, these chairs and these monitors, I'm actually using iMesh. They have a nice exclusive collection of models. This is not sponsored, by the way. They were recommended to me by Aaron Dell. It also does a lot of kind of like architectural design and stuff. And I actually like their selection of models. So I signed up for their subscription. And yeah, it's just very easy to download. And a lot of those models are like pre-made into blend files, which you can copy over. Because let's face it, if my attention span was already going to make all these assets, no, 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 no. But of course, there are loads of other places in the Blender community where you can get assets like that to help you visualize. And like we mentioned a couple of videos ago, with the new asset browser coming, if you do make your own assets for visualizations and plans and stuff, you can put them into your own library, mark them as assets and reuse them again in the future. So, you know, why don't I give that a try now? If I right click the gaming chair, choose mark as asset, and boom, there it is right in the asset browser. So Blender is becoming perfect for plan concepting like this. These assets were already appropriately sized for meter unit measurements. So they already matched up perfectly with how I estimated the size of my character in the scene. I always stick with meters as my base measurement because it just makes more sense to me. But if you need to change them, you can go to the scene properties down here and then under units, you can change the unit system. So you can change it from metric to imperial, change the unit scale, and then all of these individually. It's very handy. I love the blender gives you that freedom rather than imposing a unit scale on you. So let's talk about materials and lighting. You notice that there's some variation on the material on the floor here. This is not a texture. I love procedural materials in blender. If I open this up in the object view, you can see it's very basically a noise texture. Plugging into a color ramp, we have a slightly lighter and a very slightly darker grayscale color. And that's plugging into both the base color and the roughness of a principal BSCF shader. So it's very handy. It's very quick. It's very easy. It's simple and it gives you essentially infinite detail. It's just a slight bit of color variation. And since I don't actually know what exact material is going to be on the floor, I think it gives us a nicely ambiguous visual. A similar thing with the wall texture here. It's got this very contemporary gray layout. And you can see here in the nodes, I essentially just took a Voronoi texture and stretched it out on one axis on the scale. Similar thing with the color ramp, mixing it with black to darken it a bit. And if I change this, you can see how we can go from white to blacks as well. So you can make the walls darker or brighter very easily with this while keeping that kind of weird stretched wallpaper effect. 
And I just like this contemporary style. Because we're using EV, we don't really have as much control over bounce lighting and stuff. So to visualize mood lighting around the room, what I did was I put emissive bars alongside the workspaces. And I can explain the colors for these. I think blue has this very kind of intellectual and emotional processing value to it. And I've spoken a bit in the past about how I'm emotionally stimulated by different colors in different ways. So I gave these a basic emissive material. And then I also added point lights alongside these bars. So we can kind of visualize how the light might move up the wall a bit. Orange for me is a very warm color. It kind of reminds me of, you know, when you're in the shower. I feel like when you're in a warm and a bit of a trance-like environment like that, it kind of helps your creativity to connect dots between different ideas. I tend to have all my best and clearest ideas when I'm in the shower for some reason, and I feel like a warm environment kind of encourages that. So that's why in this case, all the work environments are blue and the strategic admin environment is orange. And because we can't really have the bounce lighting in Eevee at the moment, unless of course you use the SSGI add-on, but I think that might be adding some real-time GI in a future version of Blender anyway, I made sure to make good use of the bloom effect, which you can change here in the render property. I had some area lights on the ceiling, which are bringing light down onto the scene, but then I also created some planes, which I put alongside those area lights. Again, I gave them a white emission shader. And then from here, we can control the strength so I can like make them really bright and bloomy. So it kind of just gives the illusion that there's light kind of bleeding off, which is just a nice visual trick for Eevee. So being able to move things around in Blender and just like rapidly prototype how you want stuff to look is very fun. It's almost like playing around and doing level design in a game engine, where in fact it's very similar to that. And it's also quite fun considering your own psychology when kind of laying out a studio environment like this, because it's almost like turning your mind into a room and then having other people be able to walk into it, which might be a bit gross, but still it's kind of fun. And of course, yes, it's all a bit clinical and clean at the moment, but this is just a concept. And again, like as I'm getting more information about the exact details of the room and how we can watch it be renovated and updated over time, then I can add more color and kind of personality to it. So yeah, this should be a long-term project. Hopefully you found this interesting and maybe picked up a few tips. And maybe actually one thing that I would like to see is even if you don't have your own studio space, I kind of want to know how you would design your own space. It might be a bit of a tall order. Maybe I'll make that the next art challenge on our Discord server. I don't think anyone should take it too seriously, but I am very very interested in seeing how different personalities and different psychologies kind of translate down into like a 3D workspace. So maybe if you're interested in giving that a try, then feel free and like tag me in your results. So for now, thanks for watching. Feel free to ring the notification bell. You could also sign up to my Patreon to get your name at the end of videos and maybe even shh, sign up to my second channel because there'll be a behind the scenes for this video on there as well. So anyway, thanks for watching everyone. Have a great day and I will see you next time.